Welcome to Ball Up Top, episode three. I am joined by Jim Root, Kevin Sweeney, and Eric Fawcett. Should be a fun one today. Kevin Sweeney trying to defend his inaugural championship last week. Uh, looking forward to this. We're going to talk some Champions Classic. We're going to talk some weekend preview and play a fun game of how concerned should you be about some things that we learned in the second week of the season. Let's get right into it, boys. We're going to start today with Kevin versus Jim, both of our returnees from the first game. And let's j get right into the Champions Classic. Duke, meltdown late in that game. Cooper Flag with some high profile turnovers. Kevin, I will throw it to you. Are Duke's endgame issues going to linger further into this season? Yes, because I don't trust their guards, and I don't think John Shire does either, right? The fact that there was not even a thought to put the ball in Caleb Foster's hands, not even just to, to, to go take the shot, but to set the offense is a concern. Uh, and look, it's less that I don't think Cooper can handle it. I think Cooper will make big plays in, in late-game situations all year. But uh, the fact that other guys weren't a threat set up Duke for, for those end game turnovers that, that eventually plagued them. Jim. I think Cooper flag can handle it, but can he handle it? He can handle the moment, but can he handle the ball? I, I think the, if he's going to be the dribble drive guy, that is an issue. I think they're going to linger as well. I'll credit Mr. Fawcett here on the show for, for specifically pointing out out of a timeout. Why is that drawn up to go to Cooper flags left? That, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's kind of on uh, all the way back to Shire and the fact that, like, like Kevin said, they don't trust the guards. But yeah, I, I think for more than one reason, they will linger. Yeah, I'm giving Jim the point for uh, the the wordplay there. That was special. We're also giving Eric <laughs> Fawcett a bonus point. This is a first in show wow. history. Uh, Eric Fawcett it. making the point without even being in the point. It's special. <laughs> uh, Fawcett, you get to sub in for Sweeney now, but it's a 1-1 ball game. Wow. Or Intel decided that one. Let's move <laughs> to the winning team of that game, Kentucky. Uh, this is the 19th ranked team in the country. They certainly look better than that to me. Jim, I'll throw it to you. What is this team actually caliber wise nationally? I'm going to say somewhere between 12 and 15. I think that's where they belong. They did such a good job in the portal of getting guys that fit. Uh, our friend of the program, Evan Mia, citing that they grabbed a bunch of awesome defensive players out of the portal. It's not just shooting. I think the shooting got the attention, but they can play a lot of different lineups that work well together. They clearly meshed already, and Mark Pope is just a leader of men. Like that team, just they play hard, they play well together. That team's really, really good. Fawcett, I'm going even higher. I'm going to go like nine or ten. Like let, let's look at the teams that have made the Final Four or won championships recently. They're not the teams that have just absolutely overwhelmed with talent. They're teams that have talent across the board, but play complementary, and that's what Kentucky is. Everyone filling a perfect spot in that role. Once, as soon as they enter that ball into the trail five and everyone starts getting into their sets, everyone is perfectly situated as a cutter, as a shooter. These guys play off each other perfectly. They have a high level of talent, while maybe not elite, but uh, yeah, I, I I just think like, yeah, the, the lack of like true NBA studs keeps them out of being top five, but Every other check box is checked. So to me, they're they're ninth or tenth. I know there's a lot of discussion about shot quality and just just making shots, maybe being the narrative of this game. Uh, I just want to throw out there: Kentucky won a ball game against Duke on a night where Jackson Robinson gave them one point on four mm. shots. That is so impressive to me, Fawcett. I'm going to give you the point for this one. I think this team is definitely looking like a top 10 team in the country right now. Sweeney, you're back in to take on Eric. Let's move to Kansas. Uh, same question I just proposed with Kentucky. Kansas is the number one team in the polls right now. It was an ugly game against Michigan State. Fawcett, where does Kansas actually belong in the rankings? Third. I, I still like their, their their starting lineup a ton. I mean, if you talk to any coach in college basketball, what are the two most important positions right now? Your point guard, your center. They have an awesome point guard. They have an awesome center and really good complementary wings to, to fill it out. Um, I'd like a little bit more juice, um, a, a guy you can really take over the end of a shot clock or the end of the game. Uh, but uh, other than that, it, everything's there. They have a distinct style of play. Everyone fits well together. I, I, I they, they don't have that electricity that makes me think they're truly the first team in the country. But, you know, what do we argue here? I think they're third. Sweeney. I would have them somewhere between six and ten. Um, I think they're they're good. Obviously, they're incredibly well coached with with Bill Self and the the, the point guard and the big are, are great starting places. But I don't think this is an elite defensive team. I think their offense will ebb and flow uh, and be very reliant uh, on some of these role player shooters. And when they have quiet days, the way that they did against Michigan State, uh, that will come back to beat them. 
Uh, and AJ Storr is showing no signs of, of coming along, right? He was supposed to be the major talent injection into this team uh, that they lacked a year ago. If he's just a role player, if he's just a guy, uh, there, there's some trouble in paradise there. I like the AJ Storr point, Sweeney. I'm giving you the point. I, the upside sell on Kansas to me this offseason was entirely hinged on him. I've seen teams built around Hunter Dickinson that have shooting issues at the four. Like, I, I need some other guys to be new. And, and right now, it's Zeke Mayo. If they can get Storr to come along, I'll buy it. But I think sixth feels better to me than third right now. Let's get Jim back in here. Let's talk Michigan State. Goodness, their shooting looks like an issue right now. Uh, 20% from three on the season. They did this last year. And by the end of the year, they were top 50 in the country in three-point percentage. Sweeney, is Michigan State going to turn it around and making shots from outside this year? Uh, they'll shoot better than 20%, but they're not turning it around. I mean, look, when, when you put lineups on the floor consistently with a non-shooting five and then a four that's either Xavier Booker or Jackson Kohler, who I think will be sub 33% three-point shooters. And then, oh, by the way, let's tinker around with Cohen Carr at the three at times. And Jeremy Fierce is going to play the point. He's not a shooter, right? Like, there's just not enough shot making on the court. And uh, it seems like, Kohler and Booker have the green light to fire away, but I have a hard time believing that those are going to be consistently efficient shots for this Michigan State offense. Jim? Greg, how dare you take exactly what I was going to say. They, they started 2 of 31 from 3 last year, 8 of 50, and they finished top 50 in the country percentage-wise. Akins is going to make shots. I think the, some of the other wings will come around the guards, but if they keep letting Jackson Kohler fire away, that's, that's the biggest red flag for me. I, I think they're trying to wish him into being a stretch four, and he's not, but I'll still say Michigan State finishes top 100 in three-point percentage. I, I think the guards and wings are going to be fine. I don't know if it's Izzo voodoo or what, but I, I think I believe Jim on this, and when I dig into it, it's Xavier Booker who's the issue because they, they don't have the personnel in the front court, as Sweeney mentioned, unless Xavier Booker's hitting shots, but he's one for 11 to start the year from three. We saw this guy hit shots last year. He went into Mac Arena and hit a couple over Zach Eady. I don't know if he's a good player. I do believe he's a good shooter. I think Jim is right, and Michigan State will get there. Jim, you get the point. Final one of Section 1 here. We'll bring Eric back in against Jim. A lot of talk this week, mostly from UConn Twitter, that uh, maybe there should be changes made to the Champions Classic. Jim, should there be, or are you happy with these four programs always getting spots in this event? I'm happy with these four until Tom Izzo retires. And then you are out of the grandfather portion of the rule. You no longer have a champion in charge. You don't have anywhere near the championship pedigree. Then UConn gets in. But if Izzo wants to be there for the end of the 2020s, say until 2030, I, I'm okay with Michigan State staying in here and, and UConn can play their own awesome games outside of this event. Eric? The premise just gets more and more ridiculous every year. Like if someone started watching college basketball in 2015, they would think the champions classic is that because it's sponsored by the apparel company. Like this is not like this, this champions classic is not telling the story of college basketball. You, you want the champions there and let's make the champions classic, like the champions league in Europe, where if you win, you get a three or four year license and you're in and then after that, if you don't, you know, if you don't win a championship, well, you're no longer a champion and we bring in the champions. Like it's, it's, it's just lost all its juice. The building had no energy for those, those, those games. At least it looked like to me watching the broadcast. Yeah. I think it's just lost all its pep. They, they need to, they need to make some changes here. It looks like a Virginia poorly... in this year's event. Come on. <laughs> oh, it, uh, yeah. it looked like a poorly attended overtime elite game to my eye. Now uh, I, I'm going to give the point to Fawcett. Uh, I saw somebody tweeted that, uh, it's not called the Make the Tournament Classic. It's called the Champions Classic. You got to get somebody in. I don't care if it's UConn or who, but let's get some new life. It's Eric 3, Jim 2, Kevin 1 at the end of our first segment today. Uh, we are brought to you by Burner Ball, the greatest Discord community in college basketball. All three of these gentlemen that you see on this show are creating content exclusively for the Burner Ball Discord. You can go in there for recruiting updates. You can go in there for, for secrets, rumors, but you can also talk bets daily with Three Man Weave. You can get Kevin and Eric's film show that they do every single week. They're cutting up the smartest developments in college basketball that you need to learn to inform your opinions and your takes. Uh, shout out to Trilly Donovan for making this show happen. We would not be here doing this without Burner Ball. You can join the Burner Ball Discord with a link in this description. All right. Let's get to section two. We're going to play a game of how concerned should you be? 
I have five different prompts. Four of these are teams, and one of these is a player that we'll save for last. I want you to give me one to ten. How concerned should fans be about this team or this player? We are going to start with Eric versus Kevin. Eric, you're up first. Alabama has not been winning in blowout fashion. Back-to-back single-digit wins. How concerned should Alabama fans be one to ten? Two. I, I, I mean, look at the teams they played. They played McNeese, who everyone thinks is going to be one of the best mid-majors in the country. They played Arkansas State. Again, n- another really trendy upstart mid-major. And I think the biggest thing here is, you know, what was the big problem for Alabama last year? They couldn't defend. Well, while they're not blowing teams away offensively like they did last year, they are defending much better. So you're already seeing improvement. So then are, are they scoring at the same level as last year? No. But do we really think scoring is going to be a problem for Alabama? No. I think they're going to figure that out. I think you look at these early games, you look at the defense being better, and you you, you should be encouraged. I, I don't think that they should be you know concerned at all. Sweeney? Yeah, I'm at a one. Like the, These are two really good, really talented teams that they've played. They're still figuring out lineups, playing much bigger, uh, right? They've started Stevenson and Cliff and Grant Nelson all together. I don't think that will continue into to league play. I, I think all of this so far has been uh, has been Nate Oates tinkering and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And, and come Friday night against Purdue, uh, I, I foresee a, a resounding performance from the Tide. I don't know that I'm much higher than you guys, but I'm certainly higher than a one. So I'm going to default to giving Eric the point here. A uh, couple reasons for me. Big schedule coming up. You've got Purdue and Illinois. Maybe you get right against some Big Ten teams. But Houston, North Carolina, and Creighton also in the next seven games. More importantly, they're not making threes right now. You mentioned Grant Nelson, Jaron Stevenson, Cliff Amore together. Are we sure that group's going to start making threes? I don't really know. Uh, Fawcett, you get the point. Next up, Purdue. They lose Daniel Jacobson, iffy game against Yale at the end of last week or earlier this week. Fawcett, how concerned should Purdue fans be? Four. Um, again, it's it's uh, it's too early to be more concerned. But at the same time, I think you look at some performances where they haven't looked great. And then you start to look at who could they get more from? I mean, Braden Smith has been awesome. Trey Kaufman Wren has been really, really good. And, and still the team doesn't look great. And I mean, like, Cam Heidi's out there getting cardio, not doing like you just forget these on the floor. So while it's not like while they don't look bad, you kind of look at them and say, hey, some of their best players are playing awesome basketball right now. And they still just don't look like they have it. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it should be a a, a terrible cause for concern, but you've got to kind of look at like, hey, if our two best players are going to play awesome and and, and still we're not going to blow out Yale like. What what's the ceiling here, Jim? Yeah, he hit the point right at the end there. Ceiling. If you're thinking you have a chance at a repeat Final Four, you should be at like a nine. If you think, oh, we're just a top twenty five team, you should be at about a two. So I'm going to weigh that out to a five, five and a half. No, Jacobson takes away that big time rim protection they were hoping to get. The, the sort of ED replacement. It's not Wilberg. It's just not. I'm sorry. Uh, and then Colvin, Heidi. At least they looked better against Yale. Signs of life, but I think this is just a, a lower end top twenty five team for Painter. Not not a lot of upside. Coming to terms with identity is what I would describe Purdue as going through right now. And uh, Jim, you mentioned the player I was looking for, Will Berg. That's not the answer for me. Jim, you get the point. Uh, we'll bring Sweeney back in. Jim has three points. Eric has four. Sweeney at one. He's got some work to do. Let's talk Villanova. Kyle Neptune. Villanova fans certainly feeling like they want to burn it all down. Uh, I'm assuming high scores on this one, Jim, one to 10. How concerned should Villanova fans be? I'm going to go the other way. I'm, I'm going one. This is exactly what Nova fans wanted. <laughs> this is what they were hoping for. Um, I, I, I know a couple of Nova fans personally, and they're like, look, I mean, it's either got to go really bad or we actually see a good year. And it started pretty poor. So I, I think they're actually long-term optimistic about this. I think they start panicking if they go like 19 and 14 and it's keep Neptune time. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah, Jim kind of stole my thunder there, but uh, <laughs> swing it to the other side. It, it's a 10 in terms of basketball this year, right? I mean, all the things that they did that you would think could what was the plan have seemingly failed, right? The, the whole, let's bring in a five to play next to Eric Dixon. That that has been a disaster. Enoch Boachi was basically off the floor uh, in, in the second half against St. Joe's. Uh, Brickus was great against St. Joe's, but it's been pretty poor otherwise. 
They are extremely reliant on Jordan Longino, which I don't know how you could have watched Jordan Longino the last two years and thought that was the answer this season. Uh, it's just not pretty for anyone not named Eric Dixon right now. And, and it's a massive failure by this, this staff not to have surrounded a, a legit star in Dixon with, with better talent around him this year. It's a great point by you both. Uh, Jim, the advantage going first here, ball up top, winner stays. He's getting the point on that one. We may need to tweak the format of the show at some point, but for now we're rocking with this. Uh, let's bring Eric back in. Jim gets the point. A quiet night the other night where nobody seemed to notice that Oregon needed overtime to survive against Portland, 303rd on Ken Palm. Jackson Shellstead's had a quiet start to the season. Jim, what should Oregon fans be thinking? One to 10 concern level. I called it a seven. I, Portland lost at home by 40 to UC Santa Barbara, and then you went to overtime with them. And I, I noticed because I had minus 26 and a half, Greg. So I was <laughs> I was hyper aware of how poorly this went. Uh, but then just the Shellstad thing, I think that that's a great point. He's been just kind of uh, walking along this year. He's missing shots. He's not really making plays for his teammates. I, I would go seven, and, and perhaps that's not high enough. Eric? Yeah, I'm I'm like a three or a four. Like, look, it was a really bad 40 minutes for Oregon. When it went to overtime and it was do or die time, they won a five minute period, 13 to three. They they took over. They said they got down to business and they showed who they can be. Um, you know, Jackson Shell said like, yeah, maybe a little quiet, but he's got 12 assists and zero turnovers. He played a safe game that was really responsible. And I think that uh, they probably shouldn't have messed around with that zone and that 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 pressing against Portland because that's what kind of allowed them to score. That tinkering didn't work. But yeah, ag again, I'm looking right now for, for, for ceiling and what teams can really put the pedal to the metal when they need to. And yeah, it was a sloppy, awful 40 minutes. But when it was like, hey, we need to assert our dominance, they absolutely did for five minutes. So yeah, there's got to be some concern there so i'm at a four but at the same time those, those guards are playing responsible taking care of the ball and uh yeah i still think they could that that style of play is is, is going to play in the big 10 had no idea 12 assists to zero turnovers fact checked it it's true that's gonna earn you the point here Fawcett. um yeah i i don't know there's a lot of big 10 teams doing this right now they say it's good to win those games when you just have an off night at least oregon got the victory final one in this segment Let's talk Con Knipple. Uh, 20 shot attempts in Duke's loss to Kentucky. Five for 20. A lot of good looks he missed, but some tough ones too that didn't go down. How concerned should Duke fans be with Con Knipple 1 to 10, Fawcett? Yeah, again, I think you got to look at the stuff that he can do more than uh, what he does on an off night. And hey, his off night was 14 points that a lot of them came when they, they they really needed it. And we talked, of course, about the plays that really let Duke down and lost them the game. That was not in in Con Knipple's hands. I, if, if that's a down game for him, I think you have an incredible player. We saw him make shots the first two games at a high clip. Um, will he have another 5 for 20 game? Um, you know, I doubt it, but it is possible with the young player. But I, I, I'm looking all at the upside and, and what he can do um, on the positive end and, and say, yeah, you're going you're gonna to live with a couple of those wide open missed shots because look what he does curling off screens look what he does sprinting off a baseline out of bounds play and making shots like I, I think that that they should be extremely excited about him and and the, the concerns got to be one or two for me Sweeney yeah I'll give it a six and it's less about Con Knipple and more what Duke is asking Con Knipple to do right like I, I think if Duke is going to be this reliant on him not just taking shots but also having to hunt his own offense and and kind of get to those kind of midi isos like that's not really who he is that's not what he was even as a recruit right the cell was was elite shooting and you know a little bit of feel right which is what he has and i think he can be uh i think he can be really good for duke but the fact that he had to take 20 shots in this game because there's not a reliance on caleb foster there's not a trust in tyrese proctor and they're getting essentially nothing offensively from the bench that to me is what i'd be worried about if i'm duke Sweeney hit the nail on the head for me. I buy him as an elite floor spacer right now. And to me, it's a different version of Duke than I want to buy if they want him taking this many shots as a featured action option. So, Kevin, you get the point. Let's update the scoreboard here. We got Fawcett with five. We have Jim Root with four. We have Kevin Sweeney with two points before we head into section three. First, I want to throw it to you, Jim, though. What's going on with you and the three-man weave guys over in the Burner Ball Discord? Yeah, hop in and join us. We've got a great, very, very lively uh, betting channel. Just people are always chattering, bringing up what they're on. There's a lot of give and take of like, oh, somebody talked me out of this bet and somebody will come in with a really good fact on one side or the other. 
Uh, and then the Wee Boys, we're always just jumping in when we can, giving our opinions on games, telling people what we're on. We have a a spreadsheet where we do track a couple picks of the day for each of us. We're combined up five units this year. That's good. Hey, uh, it's, it's positive investment if you're paying for the Discord. But uh, I think that the value is more in just the insight from all the people that are joining, bringing their own unique perspective to it, and uh, just the, the things you can learn from random people and, and fans of their own team. Up is good in betting. I would not know this season. So it uh, sounds like the Burner Ball Discord pays for itself. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Three Man Weave. Let's get to section three. Uh, we're going to start here with Kevin versus Jim, and I want to preview some Friday games here. There's five that I've got my eye on. Let's start with Alabama-Purdue. Ken Palm has Purdue by two at home in Mackey Arena. Kevin, what do you think is going to happen? And Purdue's getting beat up in the paint right now and i know there's so much narrative about alabama being a three-point shooting team but everything for alabama stems from its ability to get the ball into the paint and i think they will do that at will uh against this purdue team i, I don't know that it's it's probably not post-ups the way it maybe was for yale but uh i i think alabama is going to live on the interior and, and dominate this game from there and uh, look, I, I don't know that they'll be able to pull away completely because Purdue is an incredibly tough team to beat on its home court. But I, I like Alabama to make a statement in this game. Jim? I'll go Purdue. The home court, Mackey Voodoo, my, my favorite home arena I've ever been to. And, you know, I haven't been to all of them, so there's certainly a lot on the list. But I, I think that's going to continue to bug the Alabama shooters that have not gotten hot. The replacements for Aaron Estrada have not been good the last two games. And I like if they're going to play drop coverage with Omo, with Cliff, Big Cliff Omori, that's where Braden Smith lives. Let him get to the elbow, pull up jumpers. If they got to try to alter it, maybe Braden Smith starts picking apart this defense that I still think has some weaknesses outside of the paint with Cliff. Uh, I'll go with Purdue to, to surprise everybody. I think a lot of people are going to, going to be with Alabama. Public does feel like it's going to be on Alabama here. I, I like the drop coverage point, Jim, but I am stuck on something we said earlier in the show. Braden and Fletcher have been great. And it hasn't meant a ton for Purdue in these type of games. I could see that script following here. If they just give up too many points at the rim, I'm leaning Alabama as well. Kevin Sweeney's going to get my point. Let's get Fawcett back in here for Ohio State against Texas A&M. Ohio State all the way up to 15th on Ken Palm with three-point underdogs per Mr. Ken Pomeroy in this one. Sweeney, what do you think is going to happen? I think Ohio State's going to stop shooting like 50% from three, and, and Texas A&M is able to sort of drag them into the mud a little bit, right? I, like, I, I think... This could go either way, but I don't love backing a team that is probably shooting an unsustainable three-point percentage when they go on the road for the first time and take on a salty defense like a Buzz Williams team will put on the floor. I like a and uh, and uh, Wade Taylor to find a way to lead them to victory. Pause it. Yeah, Ohio State's probably not going to keep shooting 48% from three, but they're probably going to shoot 40. I mean, Texas A&M last year uh, was 351st in the country in three-point attempts against um, this year it's early, but they're giving up a bunch still. So they're going to let Ohio State take open shots. They're going to pack the paint and, and and dare them to shoot. And Ohio State has players up and down the lineup that can knock down those shots. So I, I do think Ohio State wins this one. Like, yeah, will Texas A&M um, get a few offensive rebounds around that that Ohio State front court? Like, yeah, but what does it amount to? It's it's going to be a couple of put back twos here or there versus Ohio State that's probably going to launch 30 wide open threes. So uh, give me the team that's shooting the threes over the team that's best way to score is to throw it at the backboard and try to put it back. Fawcett brought the numbers and he's going to earn the point because he did. John Mobley's a name to remember here. Seven for eight from three this season. Obviously that's unsustainable, but I buy his jumper. Seth Davis at halftime of last game said he's not going to keep doing this on the Big Ten Network. He kept doing it in the second half at this point. I can't doubt it. Fawcett gets the point. Uh, game three here, Arizona in the Kohl Center on a cold November Friday evening. Uh, Fawcett, what are you expecting? Yeah, two teams that uh, want to kind of dominate inside and, and rebound the basketball. And if you want to call that a little bit of a wash, um, one team is awesome in transition. The other team can't score in transition. So give me Arizona, uh, who can absolutely dominate on the break. Uh, I think this game is somewhat played to a you know competitive stalemate uh, in a half-court situation. But I just think Wisconsin gets nothing on the break, and Arizona dominates in that area. So uh, give me Arizona because of that. Jim? I'll go Wisconsin because they take that away. I, I think you, it's really hard to run against the Badgers. They don't crash the offensive glass that hard. And 
It's helped them get back. It's kind of been a staple of the team. Their possession length defensively is always really long. Uh, and I just I don't I don't really trust Caleb Love in his first road environment here. Arizona's fattened itself up on two teams that flew from Buffalo, New York, and Norfolk, Virginia. Great, congratulations! You brought them to death or to, to the desert and took care of business. But uh, I think it's going to be a different story here. Wisconsin much better in the half court, and Arizona's struggled when teams slow them down the past couple of years. Yeah, I like the point of preventing transition. And uh, Jim, you, you made the case for Mackey Arena. I can't go zero and two with home court voodoo for Big Ten teams on Friday nights with you. Jim gets the point. Let's get Sweeney back in here. Marquette and Maryland, another interesting one here. Two teams that have not shot the ball well from three just yet, but I certainly believe that both could get back on track in this game. Jim, who you got? I'm going with Marquette, going on the road here. Not not the home Friday Big Ten team for once. And it's because of the ball pressure. Chase Ross and Stevie Mitchell have just been making life miserable for opponent guards, uh, both way, way up there in steal rate. And they're just, they're, they're hounds. And, and really, you've only got one true ball handler in, in Jacoby Gillespie for Maryland. I think that's a bit of a problem. They've tried to play through Queen as like a pressure release. Maybe that works here. But I, I like that Marquette ball pressure. And, and I trust their guards and their wings to shoot it a little better than I do Maryland's. Boss it. Oh, wait, Sweeney. I thought it was Sweeney. Sorry, I was. Mm, no, I believe it. Is it? I'm, I'm getting shorted by turn. What, what's going I, oh, on? Yeah, you're getting My turn. bad, fellas. It's Sweeney. Sweeney, go. <laughs> Look, I don't, I don't think we know what we don't know yet with this Maryland team. They've blown out some really, really bad teams so far. Uh, I like them at home here, though, right? I mean, look, this is a great stylistic test with, with Maryland's two bigs against uh, Marquette's lack of size. Curious to see if... Maryland can kind of impose its will on the game. I think one thing that Shaka Smart's teams traditionally do really well is is force teams to play their style. Uh, but I, I think you can't overcome the, the length and the physicality that, that Maryland has. I, I take them in a tight one at home. Tony Reale is good at this, is my takeaway. Uh, Sweeney, <laughs> you're going to get the point mostly because I feel bad, but also I think Maryland might beat up Marquette on the boards in this game. Derek Queen's got to get back to the 20-rebound guy that he was in game one instead of the last two, but... Uh, I'm buying the Terps a little bit, which is a weird thing to say. It is Kevin versus Eric for the final point of round three, a game that I'll be in the building for tonight. TCU against Michigan. Ken Palm's got Michigan by eight. Kevin, what should I be watching for? Uh, watching to see if this Wolf-Golden uh, partnership can continue to evolve, right? Like I think mixed bag so far would be the, the best way of putting it, and you face a TCU team that is always incredibly aggressive on the boards, uh, does a great job of, of offensive rebounding. One thing Michigan has not done so far is, is rebound the basketball at an elite clip. And that, to me, would be uh, very concerning if you're going to play as big as they are. Uh, I think this is a good test for Michigan. I, I like Michigan to, to find a way, but I expect to be closer than, than the line will indicate. Boss it. I think in a game like this, um, we see this Danny Wolf, uh, Vlad Golden pick and roll. That has been one of the most interesting plays in college basketball, um, where you got your seven footer handling and just throwing it over the top of smaller defenders, hitting rolls, hitting corner skips. Um, TC was not equipped to handle that. Um, you're going to see Ernest Uday and Brendan Wedzel um, guarding pick and rolls um from a four or five on on Michigan. Like that's just something they're not equipped to do. I think Michigan wins this one by. 13 or 14 and uh, me and Kevin end up doing a scout team video on uh, Michigan running four or five pick and rolls. Boss said, I hope you're right desperately. And I would obviously pay to watch that video. Uh, I'm skeptical though. This Wake Forest game scared me, fellas. I, I think the athletic concerns that the Wake Forest front court posed against two non-rebounding, non-athletic bigs really led to that Wake Forest victory. TCU can do a little bit of the same with Uday. So I'm giving the point to Kevin Sweeney here. We've got a close one as we head to our final round here. Eric Fawcett, six points. Jim Root and Kevin Sweeney, both with five points, six points left on the board. Uh, both or, or prompts are worth double in the bonus round. We've got three prompts remaining. But first, I want to throw it to both Kevin and Eric. We'll throw it to Sweeney first. Uh, tell us about what you two are working on in the Burner Ball Discord this week. Yeah, one of the things I love about this this show concept we're doing with with Scout Team is the ability to uh, quickly react to some of the biggest moments and biggest games. So over the weekend, when Auburn beat Houston, we could hop on a Zoom the next morning and, and put together a 15-minute film breakdown of, of what 
went well and what didn't for, for both sides and, and how Auburn was able to make some some key tactical adjustments that, that won them the game. Cur encourage you all to subscribe and, and see stuff like that. And, and our, our chat channel, just like uh, Jim said, is teaching, teaching people lessons on, on gambling. It, it, it's been a treasure trove of, of, of cool stuff from, from different fan bases popping in. Hey, like, did you see what Illinois just did with, with this action? Or, hey, look, look what UConn just ran out of bounds, right? Stuff like that, that that's really fun. And, and look, I think Fawcett and I would both agree it's impossible to keep up with everything. It's such a vast sport landscape. So uh, the more eyes, the better. And we've got some smart ones uh, on the Burnable Discord. Love it. Great to hear. All right. Good work to all three of you on this episode today. Great work all season long. As always, join the Burner Ball Discord to get more from all three of these gentlemen. Uh, three prompts left. All three of you are in for each of these. Each one is worth two points. Again, Fawcett with a one point lead, six to five to five. Kevin Sweeney's going to go first on these. Give me a weekend, Saturday or Sunday game you are most excited to watch, Kevin. Maybe this is the journalist in me, but I'm a sucker for the Patino versus Patino storyline. And I think this game will be really competitive, right? St. John's has not been overwhelming so far. Um, I think still kind of trying to find their identity with all these with all these guards. Uh, and look, New Mexico has been excellent. Uh, I mean, I thought they straight up out-talented UCLA last Friday night. Uh, I think that says something about UCLA, but also something about New Mexico. Donovan Dent is... Uh, incredibly fun to watch, and Nelly Joseph has made the jump. So, uh, look, I think that game has a chance to be a lot of fun and, and could be an early statement for the Mountain West. We'll go to Jim next. I'm looking at Wake Forest and Xavier on Saturday, just kind of a prove-it bowl for me. Both these teams are undefeated still, but Wake Forest obviously last year didn't make the tournament because they couldn't do it away from home. Now they get a chance to go to Xavier and, and show it, but they're down 30 spots in Ken Palm right now, Wake Forest, despite being 4-0. On the other hand, Xavier's down 15. Like they haven't been a convincing home favorite like they typically are at Cintas. So I, I'm going to feel hopefully differently about at least one of these teams after this game, unless it's just an odd rock fight. But I want one of them to actually go out and emphatically prove that they're worthy of the tournament. Fawcett? Uh, I, I'm really looking for games that like will matter in March, like matter on Selection Sunday. I'm I'm looking at St. Mary's and and Nebraska. Um, St. Mary's, of course, a team that's 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 going to need to compile some some wins like this if they're going to reach the ceiling of what they're looking to do. And I, I still love watching St. Mary's and the way that they just slow the game down and play so tactically, and then go against a team like Nebraska who wants to play a little bit faster, spread things out, and and, and play that way. So good clash of styles and a game that you know we might look back at a selection Sunday and be like, man, that was a big one for particularly probably St. Mary's. All right. Fawcett's selling me on bracketology. Jim selling me on underachieving team. Sweeney's selling me on father versus son. Uh, I think I'm most bought into father versus son, mostly because I think father might be playing some mind games. Kadari Richmond off the bench right now. Is this a message? Is it not? I don't know. Is he just messing with Richie P? I don't know, but I'm tuned in for it for sure. Kevin's going to steal the point there, and Kevin takes the lead. Seven to six to five is now the score. It's still anyone's game. Next question. Who's on upset alert? Give me a top 25 team. Define that however you want. Ken Palm or polls either way. Give me a team that should be on upset watch this weekend, Sweeney. I think Indiana is in trouble against South Carolina this weekend. Um South Carolina obviously got a lot of heat for their North Florida loss, but North Florida looks not bad. And South Carolina blew the doors off a Towson team that a lot of people picked to win the CAA. Like they have a stud in Colin Murray Boyles, who I think is the best front court player in that game. Uh, yes, that is beating Malik Renew and Umar Ballo. If their guards can just hang in, I think they have a chance to pull a shocker at Assembly Hall. Let's go to uh, Fawcett this time. Oh, to me, it's Ole Miss who's who's going to fall at Colorado State. Like, Ole Miss has just been teetering on a knife's edge. They almost lost to Grambling State one by two. Did not have a comfortable game with South Alabama. That one was close right down to the end. So it, it just seems like they've already almost been upset twice. Now they're playing a Colorado State team um, that can put points on the board. And again, with Ole Miss wanting to play slow, play games in the 60s, it's 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 going to come down right down to those final couple of minutes and, and who can score. And I, and I I think Colorado State knocks them off I, again. Like Ole Miss has just been flirting with disaster too many times already in this young season. Um, this is the time they actually lose. Jim, I'll go real extreme here. I'm going to go Creighton hosting UMKC. I, I just think Creighton hasn't really been that convincing, and this is by far the most athletic team they're going to play. I know there's played Houston Christian and dominated from start to finish, but that was almost not real basketball. And UMKC's got the giant killer mentality. They play slow, 
They take a ton of threes. High variance game. They're going to try to move Kalkbrenner around, bring him out around the perimeter. We saw UT Rio Grande Valley have a lot of success with that. Big, big spread. Ken Palm's got a 21, so this is a big shot in the dark. But I, I think the Ruse are going to be really feisty, and Creighton's going to have to actually bring their A game. Jim, last week you almost gave us an upset. It, it almost came true in this very time in the show. I think I got to trust you again here when you go big. We like extreme on this show. I've also been uninspired with Creighton. Shout out to Houston Christian for the backdoor cover last yeah. night, by the way. A little 8-0 run in the final minute. Uh, it is 7-7. Seven to seven. Jim and Sweeney tied. Eric Fawcett was six points. That one bonus point when he wasn't even in the props could <laughs> come back to play Huge. here. It's anyone's game. Whoever wins our final topic will win the show. We're going to go to Jim Root first. Jim, give me your opinion that has changed the most since night one of college basketball season. It is that the Big East is good and has depth uh, because right now you look at Villanova, Seton Hall, Butler, Providence. I don't think any of them look very good. And if you need DePaul and Georgetown to be your depth, you are in trouble uh, even the top of the, the Big East hasn't looked that good. Marquette barely got by George Mason. They're up five with four minutes left. Barely got by Central Michigan. Creighton hasn't looked that good. We just talked about that. Even UConn, they've extended late, but they haven't really been blowing the doors off teams from the opening tip like they have in the past. I, I just haven't been overly impressed with the Big East from top to bottom, and, and that's kind of surprised me. I thought it was going to have a bounce back year. Let's go back to Fawcett. Matt, every year I'm the Gonzaga defender going into the year. And then for some reason going into this season, I'm like, I, I don't know if Ryan Nemhard's it. I don't know if he can make a shot. I don't know if this team can guard. And then just a couple games in, man, I, why doubt them? Get Let's get back to the fundamentals here. I I, I love how they play. Um, their offense is incredible. Are there, are there going to be some defensive problems? Sure. But, you know, one of my big things this year is I think offense wins. I think offense is going to win championships across multiple leagues this year. Uh, I'm just offended at myself. I can't believe I allowed myself to to doubt Gonzaga. And in just a couple of games, I've completely flipped. I, 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 I'm i in on them. Sweeney? Yeah, I was a buyer on the Big Ten's Western flank, right? I thought uh, Oregon and UCLA had a chance to maybe push for, for a conference championship. Thought Washington would at least be in the mix for in 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 the NCAA tournament picture, given great offs for and Danny Sprinkle. Uh, it hasn't been great for anyone so far. Even USC uh, struggled uh, the other night against UT Arlington and and was really you know taken to the death in that one. So um, I, I think the the reaction that maybe those teams could could climb in a, a down Big Ten may have been a, a bit too strong in the preseason. I feel like I get to play defendant at this point in the show with everybody's fate in my hands. I really love this. Uh, I'm going to nitpick two of these three arguments and leave us with a winner. Uh, Sweeney, I don't think Big Ten is necessarily about just the West Coast teams and what are they. There's nobody good at the top either. Just because they look disappointing doesn't mean they're out of the Big Ten race. Uh, I don't think you should, should flip that take just yet. Eric Fawcett. Gonzaga needed 50 points in the second half just to sneak by Bobby Hurley in Arizona State. That scared me. Yes, they looked great against Baylor, but I'm not convinced entirely just yet. Jim, I have nothing to nitpick. I'm extremely skeptical of the Big East as well. I think you made a great point. Uh, Jim, you are the winner of episode three of Ball Up Top. The floor is yours. 30 seconds to say whatever you would like. Oh, big, big win for the Weave over Scout team. You know, the rivalry is going to be <laughs> hot and heavy this year. <laughs> Uh, Carter Elliott probably glad he's not here. I wasn't coming for for him this for him this episode, but uh, yeah, no privilege to be on here with these guys and Greg. Let's sharpen up over that. I don't want you messing mm -hmm. up who's up. I even got to mm -hmm. talk talk smack to you too. <laughs> yeah, negative two points for me on an episode I don't even compete in. There you have it, folks. Uh, Ball up top will return next Tuesday. Yes, next to see, I don't even know when the show is Tuesday, noon, Eastern, Friday, noon, Eastern, twice a week, all week long. The reception to the show has been great, by the way. We see everybody in the YouTube comments. So thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next week. Enjoy a great weekend of college basketball.